Ferrari, John, to come and pray for the word of God. Amen. Hallelujah. Are you ready to hear the word of God? Is your heart ready? God is going to speak to us. He's going to minister to us. As I said, in a language that we will all understand. Our Father and our God and our Creator, we pause before your presence with hearts full of gratitude. It pleased you, Lord, to preserve in this century a man after your own heart called Dr. Sean Smith. You dealt with him and Father, you have equipped him for the nation and for the nations. And a time has come for him to come on this podium and speak to us the message that Lord you have prepared him for since he was here last 2018. And Father, we thank you because we are ready and you are going to do it once again. Thank you because this is revival time in this nation. Lord, you are visiting this nation in a very special way. As you speak to us, speak also to him. May you fulfill the desires of his heart. Lord, as he breaks the bread, we are ready to receive. Thank you, Lord, because you have heard our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Put your hands together as we welcome the servant of God, Dr. Smith. Abba Father. Can we all lift up our holy hands? We belong to him. Not only did he create us, he redeemed us. His redemption implies that whatever claimed us contrary to his purpose, he has repudiated it. Today there will be a redefinition from God's own quality to establish what he knows from the eternal perspective. We thank you, Father. Can we lift up our voices in the spirit and in our understanding? To you we give thanks and praise, eternal Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. We come, O oh Father, as those sent by you to proclaim the living gospel of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And we thank you that by your Spirit, you're lifting the veil and you're enabling us to see. You're enabling us to behold. And as we behold, we will be transformed, transfigured in your glory. We thank you for your church and all of her leaders, for those who have come from far and near. We thank you that our gathering will correspond with separating, just as they gathered in Acts chapter 13 and your spirit said, separate unto me Barnabas and Saul for the special work that I have for them. I thank you that special work shall be birthed and assignments for the furtherance of your church in Kenya and the nations of the world. I thank you, eternal Father, that you're ministering to us by your own design. Be glorified forevermore. All thanksgiving and praise be to you. In Jesus Christ, our Lord and true Savior. Amen. And God's people said, Amen. Amen. Glory be to God. Can you kindly do something for me before you sit down? 
Can you turn to as many people as you can, greet them, and say, I honor the Christ in you. When you honor Christ in your brother, no matter what he does against you, you cannot be offended. <laughs> I honor the Christ in you. And you may be seated. With thanksgiving to the Lord, I wish to appreciate with profound gratitude, the honorable men and women of God that stand watching over the gates of the church in Kenya. Amen. I give special thanks to Bishop John Warari. Thank you, sir. Uh, second time we're meeting. And even though it was 2018 when I was here last, it was just like yesterday. Thank you so much. Apostle Isaacs, thank you for the wonderful collaboration and the deepening relationship in the spirit. I do to appreciate. And overall, the representative of the Archbishop, Arthur Ketonga. Praise God. Um, I honor that father with great love and esteem and I know he is one of the persons who understood why I came the first time and I'm grateful to have the opportunity to fellowship and see him when we do because we are not here by our own design we're here by God's purpose Thank you, sir. And um, I also greet all of the bishops, apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers that are here. You are known by the Lord. And many times we should not confuse that there is the church which man thinks is building, and there's the church which Christ Jesus is building. And it is the church which Christ is building that the gates of hell shall by no means prevail. And we are not here for ourselves. Um, that's why whenever we enter a nation, we do not just go about and organize it without first of all meeting with those whom God has established in each nation. And we have been in many nations throughout the world. And every nation has its peculiarity. And I must say, you are a very peculiar nation. And at the beginning of this year, we had many meetings that were already organized and set up for us to have times of training that we call Christ Commission International, where we speak specifically to ministers to raise New Testament ministers to present Christ Jesus in the loveliness of his person and the perfection of his work with grace. You know, you cannot preach grace and not be gracious. If you're preaching grace ungraciously, you are preaching the truth without love. And the truth without love is unbearable. But love without the truth is hypocritical. So we need the harmony of both. <laughs> so we thank you once again for this time uh, of being with us. But I just wanted to state to you all, we are here for the purpose of God. And we trust God for those who have come. And. Uh, I came here with Dr. Annie Smith, my wife of 15 years. She's, she's at the back. Why did you choose to sit at the back? Okay, she, she wants to fulfill her prayer ministry at the back, so I understand. So I love you. Amen. A 
I've been in ministry for 20 years. I've preached most of my life. Ever since I was a teenager, I ministered at my first minister's conference at 13. And I've been ordained and consecrated to the ministry for 20 years. And 15 of those 20 years, I've had the great privilege of ministering with this woman of God. And the beauty of ministering together as a team is that you can rely on each other. And for those of you who are not yet married, I pray that the Lord will help you find your life partner. That's the first amen I'm getting since I'm talking. Wow. And for those who are married, I trust that the Lord will re reinforce your relationship of marriage because it is a sacred covenant wherein God teaches us what it is to live through the context of another. And we'll be talking a little bit about that today. Wave your hand if you're here. Now, I know that some of you don't know who I am and you're all tense. You're about to find, you're saying, who is this young guy? I'm just going to ask you to relax. And I want to remind you, it's okay to smile in church. We know that East African hospitality, that is world renowned. So let's smile in church. Because the good news uh, refers to the glad tidings of Jesus Christ. If you hear the gospel and do not rejoice, either you didn't believe it or you didn't hear the gospel. Our Father, Father, are you ready? Yes. Did you bring your Bible? Yes. Or today most people bring their phones where they've installed their Bible or their iPad or their device. So we're going to open to the queen of the epistles. The queen of the epistles is the book of Ephesians. And Ephesians is what is called a prison epistle. It was written by the apostle Paul when he was under house arrest in Rome. And Paul had ministered in what is known as a transitional period in Acts of the Apostles. During his missionary journeys, there are letters which he wrote to administer various doctrinal issues, to administer various ecclesiastical issues, to administer various issues of the faith. But when he was in prison, he called himself the prisoner of the Lord because he realized he was confined by God's divine design because there was something within him that he had not yet documented. So God had to interrupt his usual movement to confine him in one place so that he would be able to pen it down for it to serve as the foundation for the generations of the church to come. Now let me tell you something about the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul was not one of the original 12. And unannounced to the rest of the 12, the Lord Jesus Christ chose a man who was once the arch nemesis of the faith and by grace transformed him into the archetype New Testament apostle. Are you still here? Now, if you want a proof of the resurrection, there is one right there. The conversion of the Apostle Paul is one of the proofs of supernatural Christianity. He was not converted as a result of theological debate, but he was converted as a result of transformational encounter with the true living Christ. Thank you, Father. And what we find is that this man who was trained by the experts of Judaism, he sat under the feet of Gamaliel, which was one of the leading Jewish thinkers of the first century world. And he was a Pharisee, one of the strictest sects within 
first century second temple Judaism. In fact, to become a Pharisee, your candidacy requires that you memorize the 150 Psalms. You have to cite the 150 Psalms by memory, which means it was something which Saul of Tarsus was able to do in order to be recruited and accepted as a Pharisee. But I'm here to tell you, God knows how to put you on the trajectory of what he has designed for your life. And even if you had gone through various patterns, you may have not known that what you were being prepared for was not what you origin originally thought. God knows how to intercept and realign life and destiny. <laughs> Oh, wow, man. I'm going to rejoice myself. I'm going to preach myself happy today. Why did Jesus need another apostle after he had already trained 12 for three and a half years? Have you ever asked yourself that question? Why did Jesus need to select another apostle who was not with him during his earthly ministry to become another apostle? Because he wasn't ordained under the earthly ministry of Christ. He was ordained under the heavenly ministry of Jesus Christ. Paul never saw Jesus in the flesh. That is pertaining to his earthly walk. He didn't. You know why? Jesus himself tells us why. He tells us in John chapter 16 that there are many things I, Jesus, have to say unto you, the twelve, in comparison with what I have told you, but ye are not able to bear them now. There were things that they were not ready to receive because they couldn't accept the notion that Christ had to be crucified. They didn't understand the purpose of his death. They didn't understand what would happen when he would be resurrected, when he would ascend and take session at the right hand of the Father. They understood that Later, when they became witnesses of those things, they gradually understood. But there was something that God was working on behind the scenes since the foundation of the world, which was not disclosed until it was given to the Apostle Paul. Particularly, a phrase that we are going to read today, which is so crucial for this time. Because let me tell you something. You can pray all you want. Until you open the door when the answer comes knocking. The church in Kenya has been praying. And you have been waiting. And you've been trusting. And you've been believing. But now God has sent the answer knocking at the door. Are you going to open the door? Many times the answer takes the form that you may not necessarily expect. <laughs> oh, God loves to use the things people despise. Be careful who you despise. Be careful the person you look down on. Because those are God's first line candidates. <laughs> so the Lord Jesus Christ gives to Paul Something he mentions 27 times in his 14 epistles is something called mustirion. Can you say mustirion? Mustirion is transliterated as mystery. And when we hear the term mystery, we sort of think of like an enigma, something that's difficult to solve. But that's not the original meaning of Mustirion. Mustirion refers to a sacred secret. Something which can only be disclosed by God. Mustirion. In the first century world, it was used to refer to the schools which existed in the first century, which you could not be a member of without initiation. The word mustirion literally means to close the mouth. So it was referring to a, a, a form of secret understanding.
But you know what God did? God flipped the turn on his term on his head because what was secret, what was once hidden, we realize it was not hidden from us, it was hidden for us. Tell someone there's a secret God hid for you. And you know, it's good to be aware of a secret. When you're aware of a secret, it causes your heart to rejoice that you know something that's privileged. You know something that is blessed. You know something that is of great value. Can we wave our hands? Are we here together today? <laughs> Ooh. What did God disclose? God disclosed what creation was brought about for. You see, if you do not start right, you cannot end right. That's the basic principle of hermeneutics. If you don't start at what is the actual start, you will not end at the actual end. I'm sure you've heard of eschatology, but have you heard of protology? He is the God who establishes the end from, from the beginning. In other words, God's time is not linear. It's not from point A to point B. God's time is cyclical, which means we are going back to the beginning. We're going back to the future. So what is, the, what is the end going to feature? What is the end going to portray? It's that which is established from the beginning. Where is the church going to? We're going to Acts of the Apostles as it was in the beginning. The church of the 21st century will emerge with the same apostolic power as the church of the 1st century. That is why you need to be aware that when God shows you his mysterion, it requires revelation. Revelation is the Greek word apokalupsis. It's for God to lift the veil. You're still with me? It's okay to smile. You look better when you smile. <laughs> I've noticed something. As ministers of God, we will win more people if we represent Christ even in our composure, even in our disposition. Jesus had a disposition that children felt comfortable around. You know, I know you know many things, but I'm here because I was sent. I didn't just come here just because I wanted to. I was sent to be here. So I trust you're receiving. I trust you're receiving. You cannot see what is the mysterion without revelation. Because let me tell you this. Unless you know the Lord Jesus Christ as he truly is, you will misrepresent him. And what you have seen of the Lord Jesus Christ in the past is not necessarily what is true of him in the now. Apostle John, when he saw the Lord on the Isle of Patmos, he had to turn in order to see the voice. He heard the voice, but he now had to turn in order to see what he heard. And you see, there is a turning in order to see. You have to turn to review what it is you have preached and what it is you have taught and what it is you have committed your life to. Because it's one thing to devote yourself to ministry and say things about the Lord. And it's another thing to minister from the Lord. And when John saw the Lord, he fell at his feet as one dead. That's the same Jesus upon whose breast he laid his head at the Last Supper. But he was beholding another aspect of him. Can you make this your prayer? Lord, open my eyes that I may behold you. 
That's a dangerous prayer. Because when Jesus comes to show himself to you, he does not answer your questions. He starts by questioning your answers. The didactic methodology of Christ is to teach by questioning. Who do men say that I am? He teaches by a question. And after the question, he now deconstructs your answer before showing forth who he is. So God will deconstruct before constructing. Uh, you can ask God to build his church in Kenya and him not destroy what will prevent a strong foundation. And, you know, you, you have some of the most anointed ministers in the world. You're, you're powerful. You're gifted. But it's one thing to be in ministry. It's one thing to be called. It's one thing to be gifted. And it's another thing altogether to be a custodian of the gospel. Because irrespective of who we are, there is only one message which we are all called to propagate. And that message will come through us with our own particular nuances. And our own particular points of emphasis. But however, there's only one gospel which is to be proclaimed. And no innovations. Because it's a living transmission. We are not preaching uh, necessarily a bunch of beliefs. You're still with me. To be a Christian doesn't mean you necessarily just profess a belief. To be a Christian first implies that Christ himself is living in you. And that the parameter of who Christ is will be summed up in beliefs which are non-negotiable. But the evidence of Christ is his life in you now. And the world desires to see Jesus. Religion is what people do when they do not see Jesus. Religion is what people do because they need to be busied. They get bored. And, and by your reaction, I can know what kind of diet they have been feeding you. When, when you eat the food at the roadside of a mommy cooking at the side, when they take you to a five-star restaurant, it, it would taste funny in your mouth. But God will cleanse your palate. Because this is not the time of milk anymore in the church. This is not the time for the, the, the carnally minded. This is the time for the strong meat of the gospel. Because if we are to grow, if we are to mature, if we are to move on to the more perfect things of God, we have to mature beyond excitement and beyond entertainment and beyond itching the ear infection of people in the church. Because no matter how much we perform outreach, thank you, unless there is inreach, we will have the phenomenon of reaching out very far, but having no depth. <laughs> Apocalypses. Someone say apocalypse. To lift the veil. The question is, what is the veil? What is the veil that has to be lifted for us to behold Christ? The veil refers to your understanding. Your current understanding is the veil by which you interpret what you're supposed to be of God. Let me tell you something. The, the Christians of the 21st century are in many ways no different from the Jews of the 1st century. The Jews of the 1st century had Yahweh walking in the flesh among them and prophecy was being fulfilled before their very eyes. But because they had an expectation of the future, they could not behold what was happening in the present. And today we have Christians who have Christ living on the inside of them, 
but are ignoring the realities that they are partaking of by virtue of being in Christ due to their expectations, due to the outer realm distractions, due to circumstances and situations. Can I tell you something? Nothing will transform you like the awareness of Christ living inside of you. <laughs> Woo, you talk about the anointed. What, what if I tell you the anointing, the anointed one and his anointing already reside within you? There are no excuses for failure. There are no excuses for sitting on the sidelines. There are no excuses for not participating in this harvest in this age because all of the sons of God are the saints of God and all of the saints of God at varying degrees of authority are called to be ministers of God. And God is going to extend your sphere of influence when you behold Christ as he is. Can you wave your hand? It's still there. It's still there. <laughs> glory, 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 glory. Abba Father. Abba Father. To lift the veil. To lift the veil. In 2 Corinthians chapter 3, the Apostle Paul lets us know that the reason why the Jews couldn't behold the Lord is that they had an interpretation of the Old Testament that was not transitional. They didn't see the Old Testament as transitory, as one thing leading to another. They saw it as abiding and remaining. And he uses the illustration of when Moses veiled his face because he did not want the children of Israel to see the diminishing effect of glory on his face. He didn't cover his face because the glory was so overwhelming and nobody could look at him. No, he covered his face because the glory was diminishing every day and he didn't want them to see that the glory is diminishing. And Paul uses that to say, in the like manner, the Jews of the first century didn't understand that what Moses gave in the law was to introduce us to Christ. So a veil refers to an understanding. Could it be that your understanding of God has veiled you from what you are to behold in him? Isn't it sad that most people never proceed beyond their initial encounter with God? And they're all speaking about the good old days. You see, there are three kinds of people in ministry. They're pioneers. They're settlers, and then they're museum keepers. <laughs> Pioneers are those that go and remove the stubble. They remove the, the stumps of trees to create roads and highways. They are pacemakers. They're trailblazers. But then there are those who come behind them, and they now settle where they have opened the way so that civilization can be built. And then there are those who now come and study what they did and, and simply hold the museum to talk about what they did. May we not become museum keepers of the moves of God to speak about how God was moving in Kenya in the early 20th century. We have a role to fulfill in our time. May you not be a museum keeper. <laughs> Woo! And what God is going to use you to fulfill is not necessarily what he did through another. We should honor our heritage. We should honor our legacy. But we should not think that God and his grace only has one particular way of manifesting. Thank you, Lord Jesus. <laughs> Apocalypse is a root word of apocalyptic. 
which people use to describe the end of the world. You see, let me tell you something. You just prayed, Lord Jesus, reveal yourself to me. That's a dangerous prayer. Because when he does, when he lifts the veil, all that you built upon your previously veiled knowledge will have to come to an end. When Jesus appeared to Saul of Tarsus on the road to Damascus, he severed him from all that he had built his religious convictions on. You see, when Jesus Christ reveals himself to you, there's the revelation that comes with the severance. He severs you. He separates you. Our Father. Our Father. So this revelation of Jesus Christ, Paul tells us in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3 to 6. Can we read? You have your Bible? Are we together? Do you understand me? Maybe next time I'll preach in Swahili. You're still there. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 3 to 6. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Who? 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 Who hath blessed us? The power of the gospel is found in its tenses and prepositions. And this tense in the Greek is called the aorist tense. The aorist tense is something that happened in the past and no matter the conditions in the future, it remains unaffected. Can I tell you something? You are omni-blessed. Tell someone you are omni-blessed. You're blessed with all. And I look up the word all, and all means all, and that is all I want to say about all. All means all. Blessed with all blessings. With all spiritual blessings. Spiritual refers to pneumaticoi. That is of the spirit. So this is already a Trinitarian passage. The people who don't like uh, Trinitarian theology, they say the word Trinity is not found in the Bible. Well, guess what? Even the word Bible is not found in the Bible. <laughs> so to explain the Bible and interpret it accurately, sometimes we must use extra biblical terminology. It's called theology. Theology is thinking after God to perceive his mind, to accurately understand what it's about. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are blessed. Blessedness is the being of God. God is eternally happy. God eternally celebrates his Son. That's why we will see in verse 6, the son is called the beloved. The father, who is the lover. The son, who is the beloved. And the Holy Spirit, which is a bond of love between the two. God is love. For love to be love, there must be a lover and a beloved. You cannot love in isolation. So God's being is communion. God's being is interpersonal. And there's a word for that in the Greek is perichoresis. All that God the Father is, is in the Son. And all that the Son is, is in the Father. And all that is in the Spirit is both in the Father and the Son. And the Father is the eternally unoriginate. And the Son 
eternally generates from the Father, and the Spirit eternally spirates in procession from the Father through the Son. Three persons, one nature. Three hypostases, one usia. So when we speak about God, God is love. God is interpersonal. <laughs> when God created us, he didn't create us because he was looking for someone to serve him. He created us as a result of his own blessedness. And love loved us into being. The celebration within God's bosom reached an explosion point, And God said, I am going to bring forth a creature to have the same relation with me that the son has with me. And this creature is going to participate in this union. Remember what I said about protology? Where do you start? Most people start their understanding of the narrative in Genesis chapter 1. But the narrative doesn't start in Genesis chapter 1. The narrative starts in Ephesians 1. Because if you start in, in Genesis 1, you're going to think that Jesus Christ came to resolve what happened in Genesis 3. You still with me? I'm just reading. I'm just reading. I'm just reading. Tell someone he's just reading. It's not my fault I can read. According as he had chosen us in him. Hey, you're still there. You're still there. Can you respond? According as he has chosen us in him. Before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. Before the foundation of the world. That is protology. That's the true beginning. That's the first principle upon which all of the acts of God are designed. So I have a question to ask you. Had Adam not fallen, would Jesus have come? You're beginning to understand. Ah. Jesus Christ is not the footnote to Adam's fall. Jesus Christ is not God's plan B. Jesus Christ is not God reattempting to establish relation with us after his failure with Adam. Jesus Christ is not God's contingency plan. Jesus Christ is the original intention of God for all humanity. We were chosen in Him before the foundation of the world. And that phrase, chosen in Him, is the Greek term exalexato, which means when you go shopping, you find... You find uh, an item and you're thinking about your wife. Can I give you a secret? Men of God, whenever you travel, don't go back empty-handed. If, if you've been away from home, even if it's one day on mission, when you come back, never come back empty-handed. The ministration will be more powerful if you don't come back empty-handed. Maybe next time we'll have a marriage seminar when we come. <laughs> we have marriage seminars that we hold all over the world and help people in the domain of marriage. Because to live married, you need to learn. You know, Jesus taught marriage. He said, have you not read? So he expects us to read about marriage. That was your freebie that I just threw in there. <laughs> Glory to God. But you go shopping. Have you ever gone shopping for someone? Have you ever gone shopping for someone? No? Never in your life? <laughs> Have you ever gone to buy something for someone? Yes? No? 
Yes. You select something for them. They are not there. Right? But you choose something with them in mind. So when we were chosen, physically, historically, we were not there. There was not even anything yet except God. But when we were chosen in Christ, the Father chose his Son. And in the choosing of his Son, we were chosen. We were pre-selected in the elect. And so it means Jesus Christ is the elector God and the elected one who would become man. Because it is in this election that God now has the archetype to create man in his image. For there to be an image, there must be a template. The template of the image. Christ Jesus, the eternal uncreated son. The only begotten of the father. Homoousioi topatri. Of the same substance of the Father. He was the one who is the template. For God coming to create Adam in his image. Which means even when Adam was created. Adam was not necessarily the exhibition of the true man. But he was a prefiguration of the one who was to come. So that is why he says before the foundation of the world. The term foundation is katabalon. From which we have the word cataclysm. When there's a cataclysm, it speaks of a tragedy that will change the course of events. After this kind of event, nothing will be the same. It's called a cataclysm. God foresaw a cataclysm. God foresaw that when he would create man in his image, man would disobey him. He foresaw that man would turn. And in his desire to become like God, independent from God, he created an idolatrous representation of God because what God is is already in communion with man. I have only three days. <laughs> God created man to long after him. But you know what? Man's longings after God are also the seat of what is known as the fall. Because when Adam sinned, he didn't commit adultery. In fact, there were no women in the garden to commit adultery with, right? Only his wife. There was nothing to steal. Everything in the garden was given to him. No neighbors to covet. No neighbors to covet. They had no consciousness of death. They didn't know what death was, so they couldn't even murder. But what is it that caused Adam to sin? His desire to be independent like God. That's why religion is the root of many of perverse things that are done. If you want to look at the most atrocious things men are able to do, they will have a religious definition why they did it. So that is why the adversary is called the traducer. Have you ever heard of the term Satan? Satan. Satan is not a proper name. Oh, I hope you know that. Satan comes from Hasoton, Hebrew, which is to twist. To accuse like a lawyer. A lawyer traduces. To traduce is you want to catch someone in their words. So 
they will grill you, they will take you through a series of questionings, and then through something you said, they will twist it and use it against you. It is your very desire for God that Satan will use. You still there? Yes. <laughs> before the foundation of the world. Someone say before the foundation of the world. So before Adam fell, God secured us in Christ. And that's why he's called the Lamb of God slain when? Before the foundation of the world. God foresaw that there would be a disaster, a cataclysm that would change the events of his plan for creation. But within the, the evolution of events, beginning from Adam's fall, he already had a divine plan which was hidden, which was unknown to the successive epochs and dispensations. And then when everything had been crowned by the crucifixion, death, burial, quickening, raising, and seeding of Christ, God raised an apostle to say, let me show you, let me disclose, this is who you are. This is who you are. You are embraced in the Holy Trinity. You are raised in the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. You have eternally been secured and found as mine. Glory be to God. <laughs> that we should be holy and blameless. That we should be immaculate. Irreprehensible. Unimpeachable. The statement which says my son can do no wrong. Have you ever heard that? Doesn't mean sin has no effect. Doesn't mean sin has no consequence. But it means God had a plan to remove us from sin. Because what is sin? What is sin? People look about the attributes of sin. People look at the fruit of sin. Very time, many times people don't know the root of sin. The root of sin is a mistaken identity. Harmatia. To twist your identity. To miss the mark. It's an archery term. When you miss the mark, it's harmatia. When you think of yourself contrary to what God says, when you, says, when you say, I am not loved, you're taking the name of God in vain. Because God is ehye asher ehye. I am what I am. And whatever you put after I am, that is not God. It's taking God's name in vain. I am Poor, I am sick, I am not well, I am unloved, I am not appreciated. You're taking God's name in vain. When God sent Moses with the name, I am, Moses said, what should I tell the people? Who should I tell the people who sent me? He said, you should tell them, I am sent you. And so when he went forth, they said, who sent you? He said, I am. He becomes the embodiment of the God who sent him. Someone say, I am. I am. You see, the revelation of Christ includes your identity. Because as we are seeing from this revelation, when Christ was chosen, our identity was established in him. We are co-identified in him. Co-identification, meaning that to consider the same all qualities taken into consideration. You know, when you look at all of your identity papers, what is found, which picture is found on your identity paper? Your face, right? Your head. Thankfully, they don't need to snap every part of your body to identify you. <laughs> the head identifies the body. I said the head identifies the body. So when they see the head and they can confirm and certify, no, that's the head. They assume and they know this is the person. Christ Jesus is the head of the body, the church. We are one with him. We are brought into a union closer than close, whereby whatever happened to him happened to us as well. 
And when he came on earth, he came representing you and I. He stood in our place. Glory be to God. He's still there. <laughs> oh, glory. Let me tell you about something. Unless you behold what it means to be one with Christ, you'll be looking at the four Gospels as if it was past history. What if I were to tell you, when Jesus came on earth, he came in the very place where Adam fell, he picked up Adam's failure, and he hit the rewind button. It's something called recapitulation. Someone say recapitulation. I will, ex I will expand more on that tomorrow night. I will expand what happened when Jesus went to the cross. Why did Jesus die? You still here? Yes. Jesus did not come to condition God to love you. Jesus came to change you to see that the Father loves you. Yes. He didn't come to change the Father's view about us. He came to change our view about the Father. And if you are not careful, you would preach and present as though in Christ, the Father was somehow different in his deity than the Son, which is called Arianism. So it's preaching an Arian atonement. Still there. We'll talk about that more tomorrow. But he came at the very place where Adam fell. And use the very implements that were used to introduce the fall to reverse the fall. You remember when David killed Goliath. After throwing the stone that stunned Goliath and Goliath fell down. He wasn't dead yet. David took Goliath's own sword and decapitated Goliath with his own sword. Woo! You know, David means beloved. David was a prof prophetic shadow of Christ Jesus. You know, Christ took the very element of the fall to destroy the fall. And what were the elements of the fall? The serpent came and beguiled a virgin. And after beguiling the virgin, the virgin partook of the tree. And as the virgin partook of the tree, death entered. So when Jesus Christ came, a messenger went to another virgin. And made an announcement to her. And when she believed that the Lord was faithful to perform that which he had said, she conceived. And from the womb of the virgin, Christ Jesus was not just born as a man. He was born as the man, Christ Jesus. The consummate man. The man who will act on behalf of the whole human race. The man in whom all men are represented. The template from which the image was created for Adam to bear the imago Dei. To bear the image of God. That one, that original archetype entered into our humanity. And from the womb of the Virgin Mary when he was born, he entered this, this world through a door no one had ever entered. No one had ever entered this world through a virgin womb. He entered the world through a virgin womb. And from that moment, from cradle, everything he did represented all humanity. So his childhood summarized the childhood of Adam. Adam had no necessarily childhood except in the mind of God. But in, in, in all of us, we had our childhoods in Adam. As he grew, he grew all of our childhoods. All of our infancy, all of our adulthood, and every domain where Adam disobeyed, Christ's obedience rectified the disobedience. Sin is ontological. Sin affects your nature. 
We need to stop preaching a transactional gospel. There will be no transformation if you preach the gospel as transaction. So people think of coming to Jesus is praying a prayer. Oh, thank you. Thank you for your enthusiasm. Yeah. We have all these outreaches. We invest so much for people to come forward and pray the prayer. Is that important? Absolutely. But is that the only aspect of our Christianity? Where people say, I'm going to come in front. I'm going to pray a prayer. Oh, wow. I'm, I'm in. I'm a Christian. That's transactional. We need to show them transformational Christianity. Paul said, I labor that Christ may be formed in you anew. You need to learn about what it means for Christ to live in you and take this body and live his life through you. He reversed sin. And he was tempted in the wilderness. Adam was tempted in paradise. He resisted the accuser in the wilderness. When Adam was faced with the accuser in paradise, he fell. Christ resisted the accuser in the midst of the wilderness. And he overcame every point where Adam fell to the point of dying on the cross. And on the cross, what happened? He entered into solidarity with death. You got what I said? Death was never created by God. By man, death came. By man also came the resurrection. So by man, death came. God didn't create death. Death is like a mutation. It was formed by the shadow of turning. And there were four stages of death. And the first stage of death was called Thanatos, which is Adam turned from God and he had another point at which he would believe of himself other than God, which is called Haides, which we get Hades, from which we call Hadean death. Not to see, which means he didn't see God accurately. So not seeing God accurately caused him to turn from God. And that moment, he died. It says, in dying did Adam die. But did he fall down and stop breathing? No. So the fact that he died was another form of death. He started to get corrupt. He started to get weakened. He, he started to get sick. And he eventually died. And that death is necron, last stage death, necron, necrology. It means that the corpse is in the morgue. <laughs> so for Christ to reverse death didn't just happen when he physically died. He had to reverse every aspect of Adam's fall and accurately portray the father to us and show us the father where we had not understood him. Why did Jesus come? I'll talk about that tomorrow. So he entered into death. But there's a problem. God is impassable. God cannot necessarily suffer. Because God is God. He's uncircumscribed. You cannot put God or, or, or suppress the nature of God. But yet God took on the human nature, which is the created nature. Pause and think of that. The creator partook of the creation which he had made. And while he was in the arms of Mary dependent upon her to nourish him in his humanity, in his deity, he was the one sustaining Mary. <laughs> Scandalous news. Scandalous news. <laughs> the 
God cannot die. God is impossible. But yet, he partook of the nature which suffered as a result of the entrance of sin. And with that nature, he is able to enter into death. So what happens? Death is viewed as a beast. This very wild beast that has come to consume humankind. But then God sets a trap. God sets a trap. His divinity is the hook. His humanity is the bait. So death comes and takes Jesus. And death thinks it's consuming the humanity of Jesus. But within the humanity of Jesus is his divinity. So when he descends into death for the three days and three nights, death dies in the death of Jesus Christ. Death dies in the death of Jesus Christ. Glory. Thank you. Glory. And he comes out of another impossible exit. He entered through an impossible entry, virgin womb. He now gets out through an impossible exit, empty tomb. Impossible entry, virgin womb, impossible exit, empty tomb. And what does he do? The empty tomb becomes the womb of the new creation. Someone's going to hear this. Someone's going to hear this. I was present for the, the five birth of all my children. I have five children. I believe in big families. I believe in church growth by evangelism and procreation. Believe in big families. Don't let that westernization affect you. So you should only have one child so that you know. <laughs> so I was in the maternity ward five times. I know what happened. First time is always interesting, but then after that you get used to. You know what's going to happen. When labor has begun, everybody in the maternity ward is a little bit tense. They are, they are panicking. And all the doctors try to do what they can. But then when they tell the madame to push, when you see that there is the emergence of the crown of the child, the atmosphere changes. Everybody starts celebrating. Sometimes they even start clapping. The child is not fully delivered yet. Just the crown and they're already happy. Because they know that if the head has emerged, the guarantee is that the body will follow. Christ the head has emerged victorious over death. That's why we can claim that we believe in the resurrection of the dead and life in the world to come. There is life and immortality. This body shall be changed to be like unto his own. Because we know that if the head has emerged from death, the body is guaranteed to follow. So... <laughs> When the child emerges from the womb, did you know even at that point, it's not over yet? It's not over yet. 
Because until the placenta is expelled, the woman is not yet delivered. The woman is said to be delivered of child after the expulsion of the placenta. And there are medical cases where the doctors were not able to expel the placenta and it led to the death of the mother. Let me ask you a question. What fed the child for nine months? The placenta is the mechanism of nourishment from the mother to the child for nine months. But after those nine months are concluded, how is it that what once gave life, sustained life, now becomes toxic to the point of threatening the life of the mother? Well, before Christ came, Israel was under the law. And the law was given in order to prepare Israel for the time of Messiah. But after the resurrection, what once nourished them, what once kept them in anticipation, had to be set aside because it was now fulfilled. <laughs> it had fulfilled its purpose. Because the fulfillment of that law is the life of Christ now inscribed in our hearts. So we're not looking at an external law to keep. But the internal life of Christ is the law inscribed in our hearts keeping us. Woo! You're represented in him. Do you love football in your nation? You love football? When people, when people watch football and when your team wins, you know, our nation used to have good football. No more. Politics got involved and money got involved. So now the football isn't good because of politics. You have a good football team? Not yet. <laughs> when the players are on the field and when they score a goal, we all rejoice and we say we have won. We have won. You didn't play. But yet you don't say the team has won. You say we have won. Because on that jersey is the emblem of the Republic of Kenya. So they represent every Kenyan when they are on the field. The incarnation means the Son of God came and put on your jersey. He came and put on your jersey. And he picked up Adam from the realm of the dead. The icon of the resurrection represents that. He picked up Adam from the realm of the dead. He pulled him out from where he had fallen. And he has taken us from the depths of, of our delusion of separation into the profound bosom of the Father. He put on your jersey. And he has won on our behalf. And he has given you the trophy. It's time for you to stop trying to be. Stop trying to do in order to be and acknowledge what you are. Acknowledge what you have. Because what we said, we are omni-blessed. We are blessed with all. We have all now. We've been given all things. Come on, can you stand to your feet and celebrate somebody? Stand to your feet and celebrate him. Say, I am in Christ. I'm blessed with all blessings. I'm chosen in Christ. Pre-selected in the elect. I am beloved of the Father. I am predestined unto the adoption of sonship. I am chosen of the Father, manifested for such a time as this. Somebody shout amen now.
we will not experience victory unless we see his victory. We will not experience transformation until we understand his resurrection. We will not understand the Christian life if we are trying to walk in his footsteps. I repeat that again. If we try to walk in his footsteps, we will fail every single time. And if you're looking at the four gospels and you want to follow Jesus in the four gospels, you're going to fail every single time. Because what Jesus did in the four gospels led to something else. It led to him being now in you. So you're not walking in his footsteps, but he is taking his footsteps in your steps. So he is the one guiding your foot, my son. Is it my son? Step here. Step here. Step here. He said, I will live in them and I will walk in them and they shall be my sons and daughters and I shall be a father unto them, saith God. He's walking in you. He's ministering in you. You're not thrown back on yourself. This, this is not time for competition. It's not time for polemics. Man of God, you are saying a doctrine I don't believe in. Then at least say amen to what you believe in. Amen. People have gotten too used, to, too used to disrespecting people. Too used of abusing brethren. There are probably things about you too that I don't agree, but you're my brother. Strength is found when we can find our consensus. What is it about him we agree upon? We are focused so much on disagreement that we don't even know what we've agreed upon. And the church is weak and the enemies of the gospel easily attack and infiltrate. And I speak the word of the Lord to you as a church that the church in this nation need to be careful. Because there are those that will come and infiltrate and take away the favor God has given you in this season. If you do not demonstrate the strength of visible unity. There are arguments that will remain within the church until the glorious appearing of Christ. No one will be able to resolve them. But in the midst of all of them, can we find our consensus? Can we find what we believe together that we can stand together for and pray together for and trust God for within the nation of Kenya and the nations of the world? That's our strength. Grace doesn't make you ungracious. You cannot preach grace with the same mouth and insult with the same mouth. If your knowledge puffs you up, it's not the knowledge of Jesus. The knowledge of Jesus humbles you. Glory be to God. I have a word that the Lord sent me to announce tonight. As we close, in Acts chapter 28, Paul was on the, on the island of Malta. He never intended to go there. He was on the Isle of Malta after a shipwreck where he, he and those upon the ship almost died because they were in a hurricane for 14 days where they never saw whether it was day or night. 14 days, that's a long time. But then God sent the word. And Paul stood up and said, the Lord, the Lord sent his angel to say, you and all of those who are with you shall be spared. And they found themselves on the Isle of Malta. All of them swam, all of them, and I'm sure the weather was chilly like in Nairobi. Early morning Nairobi was very chilly. And the men of God were so gracious to give me the Maasai cloth, the tra traditional, traditional cloth. And I'm going to keep that, treasure that in our archives in Cameroon. And so af 
after Paul comes out of the Mediterranean Sea, what does he do? He looks for sticks to warm others. Hey. He's shivering just like they, but he's looking for sticks so that they can be warm. And while he's looking for sticks, he throws a stick on the fire. A serpent had hid in one of the sticks. And as soon as it was thrown on the fire, it got out of the flame and it bit the apostle Paul. And the people said, aha, uh -huh. this was a wicked man who thought he could escape death. But God has decided to judge him. Man of God, I'm speaking to you tonight. You have served and you have thought of others. You have given yourself in care to the needs of God's people. But yet there is a calamity that has held upon you. And in the midst of that contradiction, many are looking at you and accusing you and saying, yeah, yeah, it's God who is judging him. It's God who is standing against him. The word of the Lord from me to you is that just shake the serpent off. Shake the serpent off. Every accusation, you need to shake it off. Because the moment your heart becomes bitter as a man of God, it's no longer the Lord you're serving. A hurt man should never climb the pulpit. Because a hurt man will hurt men. Allow the Lord to heal your heart. The Lord is healing the hearts of his sons and daughters in ministry. And whatever serpent there is, just shake it off. Thank you, Father. Within the church of Kenya, my word has gone forth to extract the venomous poison of accusations. Of brethren who have wounded brethren. And of all divisions of past times. So I have called you all to flow in one mind and be of one heart. And to represent the culture of love in preaching my kingdom among the nations, says the Father. Lift up your holy hands and let's just thank the Lord. Let's pray tonight. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for your eternal plan, which is all established on Christ Jesus. Blessed is your holy name, our Father. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Uh, can you lay hands upon yourself? Any form of infirmity, affliction, lying symptoms that have afflicted any of your sons or daughters, we are made whole. We thank you, Father. We thank you. Sister, come. Yeah. The Lord makes you whole. The Lord removes obstacles from your way. Hope deferred makes the heart sick. And your heart is sick because you've been waiting for a time. And it looks like things are going to come through, but right before they do, it gets reverted. Is that right? Well, the Lord asked me to, to help. The Lord's help comes to you.
Thank you, Father. <laughs> for you. <laughs> Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Kalana mama na tiata na baru tevolus kahura ke bru palitaha e bru do kini tenge sansa palatoki. I know we believe in the gifts of the Spirit here in Kenya, don't we? Praise God. Nida teso na rabatogi ra paralia sabadira. Thank you, Lord. <laughs> Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. The Lord removes your burden and he restores your joy. One thing I noticed is that the Lord is lifting the spirit of heaviness. Yeah, he's lifting the spirit of heaviness. You cannot finish your course without joy. To finish your course strong, you need to minister in the joy of the Lord. <laughs> so he gives you his joy and receive his joy <laughs> and receive a new day. Not one day, but two day. Not one day, but two day. I said not one day, but two day. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. Whatever, whatever foreign lump is in your body, every cyst, every noodle, uh, every, every tumor is going to dissolve in the name of Jesus. The next 48 hours is going to dissolve in the name of Jesus. Rapatha kitas leta bor kenantia. Mactema ta safara patinema. Palpitations. Palpitations. Cardiovascular situations, the Lord makes you whole. The Lord removes you, removes your pain. Ye sangrathi hataha. The the lady right behind there, yeah, yeah. Are you together? Okay. The Lord shows me that like Dorcas, you have given and you have given and you have given and you have given. And there are many who have a lot to show and say, this is what she did for me. This is what she did for me. And the Lord says the following, that you will not give yourself to the point of exhaustion. Because he brings you into a season of replenishing. And you're being replenished even in strength. The Apostle Paul says, let us not be weary of well-doing. For in due season, we shall reap if we faint not. Which means the due season many times is indicated when we are about to faint. When we feel like we want to give up. And that's been a, that's been a season in your life of wanting to give up, of wanting to faint. <laughs> But he says, your due season, your due season is due. <laughs> your due season is due. And there's strength and there's replenishing and there's newness. Thank you, Lord. There's someone here, you, you are young, um, it's not like it's a young ministry, but there's an aspect of ministry you just started. And someone has stabbed you in the back. You feel betrayed. Because there's a new aspect of ministry you started out on, and you trained someone to take the, the wing of it. And the person seems to have stabbed you in the back. And you've been carrying that within you. You felt betrayed. 
and the person has taken loyalty away from you, taking people uh, who would have looked up to you and turning them away. The Lord is ministering to you tonight. And I trust the Lord would like you to identify yourself because he has something for you. You together? I am not surprised that the Lord is calling you out to bless this family. Because every, every delay, every obstacle, Every <laughs> the oil of joy will wipe tears away and remove every scar. The Lord is visiting this household. You received one cent in the name of one cent. And so the Lord visits this house. And I speak the shalom of God, the peace of prosperity, the blessing that makes whole with nothing missing and nothing broken. May there be a before and after effect that after this time of blessedness, you will notice that there is something irreversibly changed. We declare it so. The Lord gives strength to your shoulders to bear the yoke of Christ with ease. Yes, yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh, my dear, thank you, my dear, oh, ni ketla tangin, nem thing. Lord, I didn't come for crowds, I came for your servants. I came for those who are ministering to you. I came to those who cry secret tears before you. I came to those who have ministered and now need you to minister to them. And I thank you that you're ministering to your son who ministers in the, to you in the spirit. And I thank you that whatever was lost and whatever, whatever he incurred as lost throughout the years, that you are not only restoring, you are restituting. You're not just bringing back what was lost. You're taking him to where he would have been had he not lost the things he lost. I thank you, Lord, that you're giving him a greater influence in the spirit for the purpose and the cause whereunto you've appointed him. I thank you, Lord. We speak your blessing tonight. We speak your apostolic blessing to establish in a fixed place that which you have spoken to your son. It shall be even as you have said. Thank you, Lord. Amen. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Glory. 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 <laughs> yeah. When God sends, sometimes he just looks for one person to respond. And the response, who received the response of heaven, open for all to see. Thank you, Lord. We love you. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Lord. Lord is faithful. Lord is faithful. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> thank you, Lord. Let's all lift our voice. This is a holy moment. This is a holy moment. This is a holy moment. The Lord is healing his church. The Lord is healing his church. The Lord is healing his church. Hmm. Kenya will not miss her season of favor. Yeah. Because strategically, strategically, 
you're going to where you've never been before. As a people, as a nation, we need to be strong. We need to be strong. Glory to God. Uh, I call the word of knowledge out. Is that person there? Thank you, Lord. Dr. Annie, can you join me quickly here? God uses our hearts. That's why after our hearts. Because if he touches our heart, he knows he has touched what God uses. He's touched the vessel precious to God. That's why when people we minister to, to bring life, sometimes they can be used to wound our hearts. Because the heart is the vessel that God uses. Can you lay your hand? We thank you, Lord, for your healing. We thank you for you restoring we thank you for lifting every burden she has carried, oh God. The betrayal, the backbiting, the lies that she will feed. And that tonight, Father, whatever burden she, she bore, is released to you for liberty in the spirit. Thank you, Father. Blessed is your holy name. We bless you. That freedom in the spirit, that liberty in the spirit. Thank you, Lord. Shake it off. Shake it off. Shake it off. Thank you, Lord. And we declare an increased jurisdiction. You will not just stand to minister. There will be a glow around you. The glow, the radiance of God's love and light will flow through you. We thank you, Father. We thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Amen. 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 <laughs> Glory. 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 Mm. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. Well, before we close tonight, Dr. Annie, receiving a word from the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Abba Father, Abba Father. Thank you, Lord. Father, we thank you. We thank you, Lord that there's going to be in this nation a sweet smelling order one that satisfies your heart of the true gospel thank you Lord Jesus that your people are impacted with vigor and strength and on boldness to stand on the truth of the gospel there is a throne reality that is spreading the nation of Kenya. The table that the Lord is spreading is the table of his precious things. And he's inviting 
He's inviting us. He's inviting the clergy in Kenya. He's inviting the leaders in Kenya. Come and dine with me. There are things that have been hidden over the years. Now is the time. I am so eager to share that with you, to fellowship with you in a throne reality. A throne supper. A throne supper with the Lord. A throne supper with the Lord. We thank you, Father. We give you praise, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Glory. Well, we love you. We'll be with you tomorrow. And uh, Apostle Isaac. Shall we lift up our hands and give all the glory to the Lord? Just lift up your hands, give the glory to God. After we clap now, lift up your hands. Just say something before the Lord. Just speak something before the mighty God. Just say, just say something before the Lord. Just pray this prayer. We have received the Lord. Just pray that the veil of Christ may be revealed. That veil be removed so that we may see him as he is. That we may know him more. That he may be revealed in our hearts. As we have heard the word of God. Jesus. Jesus. Now, as we are lifting our hands, as we wind up, each and every one just mention the servant of God, Dr. Sean Smith and uh, Anna Smith. Just mention them in the presence of the Lord. Just ask for more grace and glory of God to be upon them, that the Lord will protect them as long as they are in Kenya and that they brought this gospel. Just release the angels of the Lord along the way. Just pray that this revelation, that doors will be open in the whole of this nation, that many will hear this word that the Lord has granted his servants. Father, we give you praise. We exalt your holy name. Thank you, Father, for blessing your God's servant. Thank you for lifting him at a time like this. Thank you for giving him to us as a gift and the message that he carries. Lord, we receive this prophetic message we receive for the nation of Kenya. In Jesus' name, amen. The final prayer. Just pray you have heard the word of God from the man of God concerning our nation. Did you hear that word? Did you hear that word? Just say something right now. Just say something right now. You should never allow the word of God to go empty, just to fall down. That word, that prophetic word concerning us in this nation, concerning our life, that prophetic word, repake, let it be fulfilled in our time. Heal us, O oh God. Heal us and raise us to the level you want us to be. We are ready. We are ready for you, too. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen, amen, amen. We want to allow the man of God just to get to... Uh, the VIP launch there for a few minutes. Clap for him as he goes out. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Then, uh, as we are standing, uh, Bishop, you're not supposed to go. Amen. As we are standing, we'll just ask us, did you receive something? Are you sure you received something? Then turn to your neighbor, tell your neighbor, 
when you receive grace, be gracious. Will you be gracious? For you to be gracious, make sure that you will come with 10 people tomorrow. Is that true? Come with all your leaders. Like for me, I have a program. I had a program and people are going for prayers. Uh, and uh, they should not go for those prayers. They will come here and to listen to the word. Amen. They will come here because when Christ will be revealed to them, everything will change. Uh, and then uh, tomorrow also, we ask you to come early. We delay the man of God. Because most of you are not here by the time that he had said that you will settle in the stage. Can we come up early tomorrow? Can we be here before three so that we may do our meeting by three? And the man of God, you, do you see that he needs more time? You see he needs more time? And tomorrow I will come with the notebooks. Amen? Not for free. For sale. Each and everyone should write your notes. Sorry, I'm not coming for them. I'm not bringing them to you. Go and buy your notebook. Come with your notebook and write everything that you will receive. Amen? Write down the revelation. Amen? Then also the last thing we want to remind you, as we said, that the man of God will be having the theosis session that it will be on Saturday. Remember those who came late? We had announced that earlier. Kesho pia tutawauliza bwana sio sana kila mmoja ukuje umebeba sadaka yako si ni vizuri pia bwana asifiwe eh, 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 kila mmoja ukuje umebeba sadaka na kama ulikuja nayo iache tu kwa madhabahu na Mungu atakubariki sana bwana sio sana so tunataka to share the grace together and i will ask the man of god uh, Uh, I will call the man of God to come here and uh, to share with us the grace. And also remember that we have said those people, or each and everyone, if you want to be in that program that we have said for Saturday, kindly make sure that you register your name there because we want you at The word of God exegeted scripture to his disciples and they did still not recognize him because he had assumed a form unfamiliar to them. You see, the glorified Christ is multiform. We need to be reminded apostolic doctrine that he is the creator, sustainer, and reconciler of all. There's nothing in this creation that does not already belong to him. He owns the patent of all that exists. He is the logos of every logoi. He is the one in whom all things have their being. So the form Christ is going to reveal may shock you or it may scandalize you, but certainly it will not leave you indifferent. Exegeted scripture to his disciples and they did still not recognize him because he had assumed a form unfamiliar to them. You see the glorified Christ is multiform. We need to be reminded apostolic doctrine that he is the creator, sustainer and reconciliator.